Okay, good. So yeah, Fotis uh, agreed to tell us about his uh, most recent uh, work about uh, group testing and uh, beating some, uh, yeah, some uh, conjectures. So yeah. please go. So yeah, so this is going to be a talk about computational statistical gaps and the group testing problem. And uh, oops. So here's the talk outline. So I will start by talking, uh, by defining what the group testing problem is and what is uh, the equation we studied in this, sorry, and this is joint work with Elias Ovek, I forgot to mention that. And so I will start by telling you what the group testing problem is and what is the equation we studied with Elias. Then um, I will do a small parenthesis and tell you a bit about computational gaps in random models more broadly to show you a bit about this uh, kind of direction that uh, may, you may or may not have seen before. Then I, I will come back to our results and I will try to, uh, to explain uh, what we did. And then uh, by, by the end, I will talk a bit about uh, future work. Okay, so uh, let's start with uh, what the group testing problem is. So uh, suppose, that we have a blood test for a disease and we want to use it to identify the infected individuals in a population of, of size P. Okay, so we have a, a, a population of size P. Some of the individuals in, the, in this population uh, in this population are infected and uh, we have a blood test that we can use to test an individual to see whether uh, this person is infected or not. Okay, so trivially, what we could do is we could take a, a blood sample from each individual, test it, use p-tests overall, and identify who are the infected individuals. However, if we expect that only k individuals have a disease and k is uh, much less than p, then most of our tests would be negative. So we would have some redundancy and it turns out that there is a way that we can exploit this redundancy and we can perform much fewer tests. So we can perform uh, N test that is much less than P by what we call group testing. Okay, so, so what is group testing? So the idea is that instead of testing each person individually, we will form groups uh, of individuals. And then in each group, we will take a, a blood sample from each of the individual in, of the individuals in the group, mix the blood sample, the, these blood samples, and then only test, use one test to, uh, to test for the disease in the, in the mixed sample. Okay. So the idea is that if the, this, uh, this test can, comes back negative, then what we know is that none of the individuals that were in this group had the disease. Okay, so with one test, we, um, uh, we, we found out that, uh, let's say in this case, uh, three individuals did not have the disease by using one test. On the other hand, if um, say uh, the, 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 the test comes back positive, then we'd know that at least one of the individuals uh, was infected. Okay. And the idea of, of group testing is that by forming uh, the groups and then uh, doing these pool tests, we can actually uh, perform much fewer tests than, than P. Okay, that makes sense for, for at a high level, what the idea is. Okay. Yeah, a good example is when there's only one sick person, for example. Right, yeah, yeah, that's a good example, yeah. So, so uh, group testing was introduced by, by Dorfman in, in 1943 in the context of medical testing, in the context I just explained. But it's, it's a problem that it has found uh, real world applications in a variety of areas. You can see, you can uh, view it as identifying uh, K-defected items out of, of a population of size P. And this has uh, many applications in communication protocols, molecular biology, uh, all the way to data compression. And as you can imagine, the, the, the problem has many variations depending on our assumptions and goals. And uh, here I will try to explain 
uh, what are these assumptions at least uh, and goals at least um, in our paper. So uh, the first uh, the first uh, assumption people make is whether the the number of infected individuals k is known. That is, we have an estimate for k, an upper bound for k, or unknown. Okay. So it turns out that it does not make that big of a difference. But for this talk and to to, to make things simple, let's imagine that the that the, we, that, that we know. Uh, what is uh, the number of infected individuals? Okay, think of it as a as a rough estimation for um, for how many uh, of the individuals are infected. But uh, at the end of the talk, I will explain uh, how we can uh, actually deal with um, uh, with a case where the the value of k is unknown. So um, the second assumption we're going to make is that k, the number of is infected individuals is uh, basically sublinear in the in the size of the population okay so in particular think of it as uh, order p to the power of alpha where alpha is a constant between zero and one okay so it's sublinear the main reason we make this assumption is that this is the basically the most interesting setting for the mathematical science if it's if k is linear in p who cannot prove too many things so uh that's the main reason, but uh, in some papers it has been argued that um, this setting models well the early stages of an epidemic. So uh, now the second uh, important um, uh, variation is whether we are looking at the adaptive or uh, or the non-adaptive setting. So the non-adaptive setting is the setting where all tests are conducted once in parallel. Okay. And this is what we would like to use in practice, as opposed to you know having rounds, where, 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 which is the adaptive setting in which we perform some group tests and then based on these results we perform some more and some more and so on. So, but we will not deal with this. We will only care about the non-adaptive setting, where we form some groups of individuals, we test the the, the uh, each the, the, the each group. And, and then based on these results, we will try to identify the infected individuals. So just one round. So I guess the, the obvious, uh, let's say case one, the obvious way uh, to do things would be a binary search, but this is an adaptive protocol, right? Exactly, you, yes, exactly. But, yeah. but probably, but you don't need adaptivity for one round, for one, because you can do all, uh, you know, I don't know, according to the ice bit of the name of the individual, you can also have log n, um, just log n tests and they are non-adaptive. With just one? Yeah, let's say the players are sitting yeah. on the bullion cube. Mm -hmm. of dimension log k right so you just do the yeah the, the faces all the faces i guess you could do two log n right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Exactly. then you identify the name of the person right like right. You, you get the ice bit of the name uh with each test right. yeah, even log k you don't need the even so, yeah, log yeah, p, yeah, whatever yeah log p Right. Actually, okay. we're going to see that we don't lose much by. Uh, I see. I by see. Okay. On adaptive. Yeah. Okay. And uh, okay, so these are this will be our, our assumptions. Now let's see what will be uh, our goals. So what I've been describing so far is um, the concept of exact recovery, where one uh, wants to uh, identify all k of the infected individuals. Actually, in this paper, we will be interested in the approximate recovery setting. And this has uh, a couple of defini the definitions. Let's, let, let's see the one that is mostly used in literature and the one we will be uh, actually uh, uh, considering in this talk. So uh, roughly speaking, uh, what we, uh, for, for a fixed number D, our uh, estimator, we will say that it's successful if it makes either at most D false negative errors or at most D false positive errors. Okay, so for a fixed number D, 
this is uh, our notion of approximate recovery. We want to make at most either defaults negative errors or at least at, at most defaults positive errors. So here's the definition. So for a fixed parameter gamma, let D uh, be equals uh, gamma times uh, K. We will say that an estimator achieves one minus gamma approximate recovery asymptotically almost surely. If, it, if in the limit, the probability of making either D uh, false negative errors or at most D false positive errors, it goes to zero. So the probability is over the choices of our algorithm. It will be a probabilistic algorithm. Right, yeah, yeah. So our estimator will be uh, probabilistic, both in terms of, uh, so, so, so probability can come in two places. It can come in how you form the, the groups of individuals. And then it, I will explain this. And then it, it can come, given the results, what is your inference algorithm? It can be probabilistic. So the probability here is um, over both of these random choices. Yeah, but, but the input is worst case. The input is worst case. Yeah, the input is worst case. Yes, exactly. Okay. So, uh, and by the way, by false negative, I mean, so what our uh, estimator is going to do, it's going to output a set of uh, individuals that uh, it believes that are infected. We say that it makes a false negative error if one of the, of the individuals that was not in the output was actually infected and we missed it. And we say that we make a false positive error if one of the individuals that, that was in the output was not infected. Okay. Right, and this is the definition of approximate recovery. And in this talk, we would care about one minus little low of one approximate recovery. In particular, we would like to establish the above definition for any arbitrarily uh, small um, constant gamma. So this is what we would care about this talk. Of course, there are variations of the notion of, of approximate recovery, where, for example, no false positive or no false negatives results are allowed, uh, uh, errors are allowed. And I will talk a bit about um, a result we have where uh, no false negatives results are, are allowed, which is very desirable in the, in the case of at least medical testing. So okay. one of them is easier than the other. Is it a good time to talk about this or not? Um, Preventing, like not allowing false positives or not allowing false negatives. I always confuse the two sides, on, but uh, I think one one of them is, uh, let's say, if K is root N or something, one of them is easier to prevent than the other. I think, um... At least in terms of bounds, preventing false negatives is needs more test. False negatives means you don't need you you should not miss any infected individual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. I think that's this a is more test. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. And this is what we improve at. Uh, I mean, we give an improved bound for uh, at least theoretic, uh, a theoretical algorithm that improves the number of tests that um, are needed mm -hmm. for this. Good. So now on designing the estimator for, um, for uh, the non-adaptive group testing problem, one needs to make two choices. Okay, so the first choice is how one is going to form the groups. Okay, so for each individual, we need to determine the tests in which they would participate in. We will do N tests. And for each individual, we need to, to, to um, to decide in which of these tests these individuals uh, will uh, take part in. Okay, and you can think of this of this uh, test design choice in terms of a bipartite graph, where on the left we have the individuals, on the right we have the tests, and we have an edge going from an individual to a test if this uh, individual participates in that test. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. This is our first uh, 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 choice. And the second choice we have to make is the inference algorithm. So basically, given the results of the pool tests, we need to use them to identify the infected individuals. Okay, this is not a priori clear how to do, but here's a very probably the simplest uh, type of inference algorithm. 
our estimator could uh, potentially output all individuals who do not participate in a negative test. This is the simplest thing you can do. We will say more sophisticated things, but notice that with, uh, with uh, the reason why this is a, a reasonable um, estimation is that an individual that does not, that, that does participate in a negative test is certainly not infected. Okay. Everyone else is potentially infected. And you can imagine that uh, if, you are, if you have done enough tests, maybe what is left is exactly the, um, the set of infected individuals. It's certainly a superset of the infected individuals, but you know you can imagine that, and this is true, that if you have done enough tests, uh, maybe uh, what is left after you have discarded any individual that participates in a negative test is exactly the set of infected individuals. Okay, we will see more uh, sophisticated uh, algorithms uh, later in the talk, but um, that makes sense. Yeah. Good. So now in this talk, uh, we will focus on the perhaps the simplest uh, way to do uh, the test design, which is called the Bernoulli group testing, which is yet um, uh, information theoretically optimal, at least for the for the approximate recovery task. Okay, so basically in the Bernoulli group, uh, group testing design, each individual will participate in each certain test independently with some probability mu over k, where mu is a parameter of our choice. Okay, so in other words, and in terms of the bipartite random, uh, of the bipartite graph that I was uh, explaining uh, earlier, you can uh, think that the way we choose this graph is randomly. So basically each edge from left to right appears with probability mu over k. And this is called the Bernoulli curve testing design. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, first, is, will you talk about the randomizing this or you will not? Uh, no, I will not. Yeah, because it seems like, I mean, it's natural to pick an extractor, right? I mean, you, you really want right. the, the, you really want this uh, small set uh, of K infected individuals to be distributed roughly uniformly on the right hand side nodes, right? That's what you want. And that's the property of an ex, uh, extractor. I think we saw and, a talk, right? Uh, what? We saw a talk in the seminar. Yeah, there was a talk yeah, in yeah. the seminar, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it appears in, yeah. Uh, anyway, you are not going to speak about yeah, uh, not, not, yeah. Okay. I have uh, another question. Mm -hmm. um, do people study any settings in which you limit the number uh, of individuals in any group you test? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so for example, you can uh, choose this uh, this bipartite graph to be regular, if this is what you mean. No, I think it means that uh, there is a limit to the number of samples that will fit in a, in a test tube. Yes, exactly. Like if, if you have some bounded, uh, like a bounded degree on the side of the test, can you, can you say? Ah, yeah, I'm not why, sure if it started as a... Sorry. Like, why can't you just wait for the... In infection to spread inside the test tube. So, like, why would it matter? No, maybe there is a space limit. No, but also I think that in in I, I just I remember that actually people did talk about this with uh, with COVID. I even talked with some uh, some virology professor in Tel Aviv University that was sent to the math and the CS department to ask people about uh, group testing uh, and. In COVID, he said that one of their uh, biggest problems is that they don't know the relation between the uh, between the percentage of uh, viral load and the probability of the PCR test to give a false negative. And he said that they were very afraid that uh, that this acts very badly if the percentage of viral load goes down. So it could make sense to somehow limit how, how much you can dilute the, the sample. Yeah, I see, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, it can be too diluted. And BJ, it's not clear that you can wait for it to spread or that it can spread inside the test tube. It's not clear. Yeah, no, anyway. It's, uh, and I think I've seen models uh, where for group testing where you do limit the size of test. There are certain, certainly models where um, the, the results are noisy. So uh, there can be, for example, infected individuals inside the test, yet the result with some probability comes back uh, negative. And uh, there are uh, settings like this that have been studied. But here uh, we, this, the, we solve the noiseless case, okay? So for example, in, in what Or was explaining, um, uh, I think that the, the, the reason you, you want to have uh, an upper bound on the, on the number of tests per in, in individuals is to avoid, uh, you know, uh, errors in the test. Maybe the test does not really capture the, um, uh, does not really detect the virus. So that's why you need the uh, upper bounds, right? And I'm saying that uh, noisy tests have been studying it, uh, mathematically in the literature, if this is what you are. So it's kind of uh, related to what Or was asking, but not exactly. Did that make sense? Yeah, it's a different question. Yeah, sure. I guess we could also, um, you know, putting everyone in one room for each test and let all of them get infected. And then you can just test any one of them. <laughs> okay. Okay. So this is the Bernoulli group testing design uh, uh, model. And it turns out that this information theoretically optimal uh, for uh, one uh, minus little of one approximate recovery as long as the parameter uh, new, that determines the probability of each edge, it's, it's chosen so that one minus new over K to the power of K is one half. And the intuition beh behind this is that making this choice, uh, then each test will be negative or positive with probability one half because the, um, the formula on, on, on the left is what is the probability that none of the infected individuals is in the test. Okay, so it's what is the probability that the test is negative and it's one half. And so uh, it's symmetric, right? which is good uh, um, uh, from an information theoretic perspective. And when I say that uh, Bernoulli group testing is information theoretically optimal, I mean that uh, it matches uh, then the known lower bound for um, on the number of tests at least for uh, approximate recovery, which is uh, roughly speaking around k log two p over k. So here is a theorem by uh, Scarlett and Sigver. Actually, these are two theorems. The first part says that if new is chosen appropriately, appropriately, then asymptotically using Bernoulli group testing you can achieve approximate recovery uh, using uh, k log two p over k tests. And the second part says that any test design, even adaptive, okay, and any estimator, in order to achieve um, uh, approximate recovery, it will need asymptotically at least uh, k log two p over k uh, tests. Okay, so in that sense, Bernoulli group testing is uh, information theoretically optimal. Yeah, okay. this is a threshold result, right? It's a, it's a sorry? It's sort of a threshold uh, right. phenomenon. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a phase transition, yes. Yeah. So I would like to make two remarks here. So uh, the first remark has to do with some intuition on the lower bound of the number of tests. And to give you the intuition, I will actually give you the proof, if you will in the exact recovery task, okay? So in the exact recovery task, we have two n possible outcomes. One, so basically basically because we have n results, uh, n tests, so uh, n results, so two to the n possible outcomes. And we need to encode which of the k, which of the, we need to encode uh, a set of k individuals that were actually infected. Okay, so basically we need to encode uh, p to k possibilities of the set of infected individuals. And therefore, at the very least, we need that 
to, to the power of n to be uh, at least p to scale, which gives that uh, n asymptotically should be by Stirling's approximation should be at least k uh, log to uh, p over k. And so this is kind of uh, why this is a lower bound for the exact recovery task. And a similar argument with some more algebra holds for the one minus little of one approximate recovery task. Yeah, maybe uh, yeah, th uh, this is uh, exactly the same bound, same lower bound you get for sparse recovery in the, you know, in the linear model, which is a completely different problem because the way to perform linear tests here is this uh, just all tests, right? I mean, they are basically all tests, but the lower bound comes from the same reason uh, because you have, uh, I guess, yeah, uh, well, almost the same reason. If you get real outputs, then it's not Boolean, but yeah, here it's a simple information theory. Right. But, I just wonder, it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's, of course, it's clearly related to sparse recovery in the yeah. signal processing setting. Right. And uh, there, there are also sorts of reductions that people did from the OR model to the linear model, where, for example, they're studying, I don't know, uh, let's say, doing fast Boolean matrix multiplications with all mm -hmm. and ends. They want to use stress and so you can reduce the or to to parities or the same thing where you do the the rasborov uh, smolensky approximation for a uh, you know, circuit uh, like a c0 uh, with parity gates uh, lower bounds um uh yeah but do you know any uh, if there are more connections or whether your results are related to uh, say suppose you are performing not Exclusive walls in the test tube, but uh, parities in the test tubes. Where I don't know if you thought about it or whether you know about uh, uh, similar results. Yeah, I think, uh, yes, I think, uh, I think I know people by, by statistical physicists that have studied things like this, but I don't know, I don't recall any paper by mathematicians. There should be one, absolutely, because, uh, yeah. But anyway, That's I think it's true. interesting, uh, whatever you show us is the, yeah. you know, what is the family of uh, family of tests, uh, uh, maybe instead of X, instead of O, the O function per test tube, if you have some other function per test tube for which the results are true or false. Or... Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think, I think I've seen a paper like this that studies phase transitions in different models, like the ones you described, but I don't recall the... Yeah, I know. I don't. Yeah, I don't okay. know exactly. Yeah. I know. So uh, the second remark I want to make is that um, okay. So why we are doing approximate recovery because we want to save some tests. Otherwise, if it was uh, the same to do, uh, we would just do uh, exact recovery. And uh, indeed, uh, recently we have um, uh, Kojao Klein in his group has identified exactly the number of tests you need to make uh, in order to, um, to identify the infected individuals in the exact recovery setting. And they are given by this uh, formula, at least when K is uh, P uh, to the power of alpha. And so the point of this slide is to tell you that as long as the sparsity parameter alpha is roughly speaking more than 0, uh, 0, 0 0.4, then approximate recovery is more efficient in terms of the number of tests than uh, exact recovery. Then this is why we care about it because we save some tests. Yeah, and how much do you save? This is what is the what's the, now I don't see the relation between the number. Yeah, of tests. so right. Um, so do you see my? Um, yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So n star is the number uh, of tests. Um, so n star is from the previous slide is uh, is is this quantity k log two p over k. Yeah. So for sorry. Oops. So for uh, so, so for exact recovery, the number of tests you need is the maximum between the number of tests you need for 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 approximate recovery and k log uh, two over k. And as uh, alpha becomes greater than uh, 0 0.4, the first term dominates. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
you, you save asymptotically more uh, tests. Yeah, yeah, asymptotically more, but I'm trying to guess to figure out how much is asymptotically more. Uh, uh, you, you. Right, uh, asymptotically. Uh, so oh, oh, I see, I see. So, so it will be uh, an additive constant. No, not, not, uh, sorry, uh, no, it, no, it, a constant times k. Yes. Right. It would be some, yeah, if k is bigger, let's say, than if alpha is bigger than a half, let's say, then uh, uh, you will, you will uh, do like a constant times k more than you would otherwise. Right, yeah. Right? So the, while the number of tests would be some like k log k, k log k, you will have to do for exact about square root k more. Right, yeah. Uh, sorry, k more. Instead of k log k, you would do, yeah, I don't know, k log k plus so, 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 k. So, 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 right, yeah. So it's it's a it's yeah it's 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 a constant factor of k log k more by this uh, of k this log factor. k more. Yes, a constant factor of k log k more because in, in this formula here, I can show yeah. you now. So one minus alpha. So for so for uh, uh, for approximate recovery, you will always need one minus alpha times. Oh, I see. Okay, right. good. Yeah, I, I looked at the first formula, but yeah, the yeah. second is more revealing. So, yeah, if we didn't have the land two, we would have alpha one minus alpha. So otherwise, for bigger than half, we would get a constant times k. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Good. Okay. So now. What I've been telling so far and uh, what this previous uh, theorem um, promises is an estimator for doing an approximate recovery, which in principle is not computationally efficient. Okay, as we will see, the estimator promised by this uh, theorem, it corresponds to solving a planted set cover instance, and I will explain this later. So in principle, this is not computationally efficient. Okay, and indeed, what researchers have observed is a gap between the number of tests we need in order to be able to information theoretically at least do approximate recovery and the number of tests and we need if we want our estimator to be efficient and recover the approximately recover the, the the infected individuals okay so between so, uh, so in this picture here, there is a, a gap in which, while it is information theoretically possible to uh, to find infected individuals, we are not uh, we don't know of any efficient algorithm to do so. Okay, and what we try to study in this paper is whether this is a fundamental gap. That is, if this computational statistical gap can be closed, and if not. Why? Okay, so these are the main questions. Uh, the, the main, the main question that we try to uh, establish in this paper. Did that, did that make sense? Yeah. Right. So, with that being said, uh, I will do a small parenthesis because this is a, a phenomenon that does not just appear in Bernoulli group testing, but really computational gaps appear in many random models. And now we'll do a small parenthesis that uh, to give you a broader picture for how people trying to, to understand these gaps, and then we will do a break. Okay. So, um, in a plethora of, of random, as I said, in a plethora of random models for constraint satisfaction problems or statistical inference problems, there exist there exist computational gaps between what existential or brute, for, brute force methods promise and what known efficient algorithms achieve. And I would like you. I would like now to give you two examples, one from its family, one from constraint satisfaction problems, and one from statistical inference problems, and tell you what people do in order to, uh, to understand why these gaps exist. Okay, so this, for now, we take a step back and everything I say is unrelated to group testing. I just want to give you a broader picture of, of, of this area, okay, and how people deal, deal with these things. So uh, to that end, I will focus uh, for, uh, in the, for, 
for, uh, for a bit in the, in the two coloring problem for random graphs. Okay, so remember the two coloring problem is you are given a graph G and two colors and you want to assign colors to the vertices of the graph so that uh, no two, uh, uh, so, so that no, no two adjacent vertices share the same color. Okay, and for now, I will study the two coloring problem in uh, the Erdos ring model. This is basically the uniform distribution over the family of graphs with n vertices and exactly n edges. Okay, so in this model, what we're interested in is uh, its behavior with respect to two coloring as the density, that is the number of uh, the ratio between the number of edges to the number of vertices increases, or if you will, the number of constraints to the number of variables increases. And you can expect intuitively that if the density is low, if we don't, if we don't have many constraints, that the problem is going to be doable. But if the density is large, the problem will, will be impossible. And indeed, this is a, a very well studied uh, model. And what we know is um, is exactly a phase transition that is around density q log q, before which the problem is really q colorable. So the graph is uh, q colorable with high probability, and uh, denser random graphs are uh, not q colorable with high probability. Okay. Let me stress, and this is the point I'm trying to make, that this is about the existence of solutions. But if we care about efficient algorithms for finding the solutions, then again, as in the group testing problem, there is a gap that appears. Okay, so in particular, um, the cu currently known algorithms are not able to find two colorings for densities that are larger that, than uh, one half Q log Q. Okay, so basically our algorithm stops, uh, stop at densities that are half um, the, the density of colorability. Okay, so and people have uh, noticed this result, and they, you know, they have, you know, tried to uh, to understand it. And while currently we do not know of any um, hardness result in the traditional theoretical computer science sense, what we know for sure is that. The, the point where our algorithm stop is not arbitrary and random, but it corresponds to a phase transition, an abrupt change to the geometry of the solution space of the problem. Okay, and this is kind of the angle in which we will try to understand group testing as well in this talk. But uh, let me come back to coloring. So what do I mean by a phase transition in the, geom in the geometry of the solution space? So um, what you see here in the picture on the left where algorithms exist, it's a large gray ball. So now I want you to imagine that each point of this gray ball is basically a solution of, of our problem. It's a proper coloring. The reason I have drawn a ball is that this is a very well connected space in the sense that you can jump from solution to solution by changing uh, only one variable, the color of one vertex. So now what happens when you uh, uh, one, one uh, uh, goes to, to, to the hard regime, as we call it, to the regime where solutions exist, but we cannot find them efficiently. What happens is that this huge ball shatters or clusters into, into small pieces, but while they are well connected inside, they are far apart. And they are far apart in, in two senses. So they are far apart in humming distance. And also, if you want to go from uh, uh, one cluster to another one, probably you have to go through uh, paths that uh, violate many constraints, paths in which that is colorings in which many, many um, uh, edges are monochromatic. And this property has been used by researchers to establish that families of natural local search algorithms fail in this regime, okay? Because this is a landscape that is highly um, non-smooth for, um, uh, for these uh, local search algorithms to navigate. 
And while we do not know hardness result for all algorithms, we can use the properties of this space to prove hardness results for some families of algorithms. Okay. And the, the, the conjecture is that these are actually fundamental, uh, uh, fundamental uh, gaps and that none, uh, none of the algorithms out there, local search or not, will be able to, uh, to, uh, to solve the, the problem in this regime. At least this is what statistical physicists uh, believe. Okay, and uh, this is uh, certainly a major, a major open problem. Uh, did that make sense? So, um, so this type of phase transitions have been predicted by statistical physicists and they have been rigorously established by our community and uh, the statistics community in a series of work uh, that has lasted for many years. And uh, for example, uh, for, for coloring and constraint satisfaction problems, it started with the work of Archaeopteryx and Project Lan in 2008. And this, let me mention that this is not uh, a picture just for, uh, uh, for graph coloring, but basically for uh, many other uh, interesting uh, random constraint satisfaction problems like KSAR, hypergraph coloring, etc. And more recently, people, uh, after they have understood these non padded models, they have been trying to use these techniques to uh, understand and uh, study the, 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 the computational gaps in what we call random planted models, like um, the group testing problem that we just saw, and in general, models that, that are typically related to statistical inference tasks, statistical inference tasks. For example, the planted click model, high dimensional linear regression, sparse PCA, et cetera. Okay. And I would like to give you uh, the most famous example in, uh, in this second category of planted models and tell you a bit how people approach it. And this is the planted click problem. Okay, so this problem was uh, um, uh, defined by Jeremy 92 and uh, has become uh, famous since then. And it says the following. So imagine we add or plant a click of size K into a Nertos Rainy graph G and half. Okay, now the goal, and this is the problem is come up with an algorithm that can uh, recover the planted click by observing the graph. Now by uh, properties uh, of uh, random graphs, we know that if the click we plant, if K is a bit bigger than two log N, so it's two plus epsilon log N, then information theoretically, we can recover the, the planet click because in, ran, in G and half random graphs, we know that uh, the largest click will have at most two plus little of one log N vertices. Okay, so if uh, K is two plus epsilon times log N, then uh, by brute force search, we can uh, actually recover the click. However, and this is where the another gap comes into play, people have observed that uh, our efficient algorithms stop working basically at much larger sizes. And in particular, we need K to be at least square root 10 for any efficient algorithm to, um, to, to be able to detect the click. Okay. And people have been, uh, I mean, even from the work of Jerome, people have been wondering why this, uh, why this uh, happens. And indeed, through the years, um, people have established what we call algorithmic barriers for many, uh, for many families of uh, polynomial time algorithms. And I think everyone, uh, uh, every expert in the area believes that this is an uh, inherently hard problem. Okay, beating this uh, square uh, root n bound. So for example, even from the work of Jerome, uh, he, sh he showed that a very uh, well-known uh, Markov chain known, known as the Matropoli process will fail to do recovery uh, efficiently. More recently, uh, Barak uh, et al. showed that SOS hierarchies will also fail. We also know that statistical queries algorithms will also fail. And 
we even know that uh, at this point, there is uh, uh, again uh, a phase transition in the solution space of the problem, which is known as the overlap cap property. And it's uh, similar in flavor to what we saw for coloring. And uh, this has been established by uh, David Gamadni and my co author Elias. Okay, so there are many, um, uh, there are many uh, angles in which uh, this problem have, have started. All algorithms seem to fail, and we really believe that this is a, a hard problem. Yet, we do not know any traditional TCS uh, way to approach this problem. Nevertheless, uh, the, this computational, uh, the, the, this area of trying to study the computational aspects of statistical inference, in which this group testing problem that I'm going to talk to you about uh, today um, falls in, has been uh, uh, a very fruitful area of research uh, uh, very recently. And it, it, it's in fact in its infancy. And people study these problems from several angles. Okay, so one way to study them is you know, by doing average case reductions to the planet click problem. Another way is to show that classes of uh, algorithms fail. For example, people show that low degree methods like the SOS hierarchies fail, that algorithms like the message passing uh, algorithm belief propagation fail, algorithms like statistical queries uh, in the statistical queries models fail, or uh, algorithms like uh, um, MCMC algorithm for statistical inference fail, okay? And uh, uh, this is actually what we're going to do in this talk. We will try to understand whether a family of MCMC algorithms actually fails for the, the, the group testing problem by studying the so-called overlap gap property, which as I explained is, um, is, a transition, is a phase transition that corresponds to an abrupt change in the uh, geometry of the, of the solution space of the problem. And I think, um, yeah, let me know if, if there are any questions. I think this is a, a good place for a break. And because uh, after the break, I will come back to the group testing model. Any, any questions question? to Fortis? All right, so good. So let's take a five minute break. So Fortis, one thing I didn't understand was what was computational about the group testing model? What do you need to compute? Uh, so, um, I will show this uh, formally uh, in a minute, but uh, roughly speaking, we need to, to you need to solve a set cover problem if you want to estimate. Um, uh, I, I will show this formally uh, if, if if you want to estimate who are the uh, infected individuals after you have seen the test. Basically, detection reduces to solving a set a set cover problem. Ah, uh, uh, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. Basically, sorry. yeah. The, it, yeah, the uh, test. It, so, it's an all yeah. right the test is an all so you yeah but but, but i will show this very uh explicit yeah okay great yeah it was extremely clear i think and this survey of gaps was also excellent i invested a lot of time on <laughs> on this uh yeah low bound, both for a uh, yeah planted click and for pca i, I think uh you have a paper with uh, with barack about um yeah, with Barak and Potechi. So my papers were subsumed by others, but uh, yeah, the first uh, yeah the first gap for SOS was with the uh, Barak and Potechi on uh, planted click, and then they improved it um, yeah significantly. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we had the low bound like root n over two to the d if d is a degree. So it was uh, you know root n just for constant. Uh, Degree, but uh, they put, they went up to all the way to log n, uh, a little low log n degree is still around uh, Rutan. I mean, wasn't had, uh, uh, Ragumik and uh, Potechen? Yeah, sorry, right. Uh, yeah, no, we talked to, yeah, with Ragu and uh, Aaron, yeah. And then uh, with PCA, on PCA, I uh, worked with Tang Yuma uh, on this uh, query. Uh, yeah, so for PCA, uh, the uh, lower bounds for SOS, and we show the degree, uh, just degree four lower bounds for uh, uh, 
the sparse PCA, and then um, uh, what's his name? The guy from MIT uh, who was visiting last year, uh, was visiting the machine learning, Philippe Rigolet. They, uh, he, may, he, he just found a reduction to, uh, um, to plant a click, and that gave again a much uh, better bound. Anyway, it's a beautiful. Uh, a beautiful problem so okay so i think yeah everybody's back so yeah uh Fortis, why don't you continue right yeah so after this small parenthesis uh let me come back to the group testing problem and let me remind you that the question that uh, we, are, we were asking is is there a computational statistical gap under non-adaptive bernoulli group testing for the task of one little of one approximate recovery and to be honest when we started working at this problem with Elias, uh, like, most uh, more, like most researchers, we believe that the answer is yes. Okay, that this is uh, too simple of a random model to not have uh, a gap. And uh, we really thought uh, our goal was to try to, uh, to, to prove a phase transition uh, in the solution space of the problem to, to, to explain this gap. To rule, to, rule, to rule out this simple test design, to say this is not a good test design, okay? Because this is what people believed, this is what we believed. And indeed, at least for the exact recovery problem, researchers have proposed much more sophisticated test designs that uh, they, uh, are inspired by the so-called spatial coupling technique from error correcting codes. So these are much more sophisticated random models uh, that uh, achieve the information theoretic uh, bound, but they also provably do not have a gap, okay, at least for exact recovery. And one could uh, uh, believe that maybe these techniques uh, propagate to, uh, uh, to, to, um, to the approximate recovery setting. And our goal was to show that really, yes, you really need these more sophisticated techniques if you want to make uh, any progress. But do we need? But, but do we know that these techniques uh, uh, succeed in matching the gap in the approximate for, 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 uh, recovery? For approximate, we don't know that. But I think because this special coupling technique, it's um, it's the go-to technique that when you want to close a computational uh, gap. So. Uh, it, it comes from error, error corrected codes and uh, it has uh, been um, uh, basically observed in, in any uh, random model for for example for random csps that using this uh, spatial coupling uh, models then uh, which are basically something like random liftings then basically th uh, this gap does not appear uh, but but right i mean are they probably efficient yes do you mean that for uh... I don't know, random SAT or uh, random coloring, you can uh, bypass the gap. You can you can get the information theoretic uh, uh, threshold efficiently using these methods? No, no, what I mean, sorry, what I mean is that, so, so, so you change the model, right? So oh, you uh, change the model, okay, yeah, I, right, I got yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, if you change the model, you don't have this scattering, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. Oh, but, no, that's, uh, that's not fair. Okay, I just wasn't sure what you were, yeah. So nobody but, has any idea how to, yeah, the other problems remain open as they were. Right, exactly. But, but, but for group testing, the model is the kind of the first step of the, of, of the design. You can choose it. It's, it's fair game to choose it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's the difference, okay? Yeah. And what initially we're trying to do is that to, 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 to rule, uh, we were trying to rule out this Bernoulli group testing design and say uh, that, uh, and give evidence that you really need this more sophisticated techniques that by the way, um, uh, give good results when the number of uh, individuals is very, very large. Okay, mm -hmm. so they have bad yeah. asymptotic. Anyway, so as we were trying to do that, we realized, I mean, we, we realized that probably the the problem is not as hard as, as it seems okay so our contributions were to give in this paper to give both theoretical and experiment, experimental evidence that suggests that the problem is um, probably not 
uh, as hard as we thought. At least this is what we conjecture. And in particular, we uh, we show three things. Okay, so the main thing that I'm going to talk about today, although this is not our only contribution, but I think it's um, the more interesting one uh, uh, for people that have not seen it, is to show that uh, in, a potential, in, in a potentially fundamental geometric way, the Bernoulli group testing model does not seem to behave as the other uh, hard models behave, the models that have this uh, computational statistical gap. Okay, so uh, uh, we, we show first moment evidence for the absence of this overlap gap property. I will explain what this means. But for now, you can think of it as that uh, the methods that we have for proving lower bounds for MCMC algorithms do not seem to apply in this case. Okay. After we realized that, the first thing we did, uh, we said, okay, maybe we can try to, to test it experimentally, right? And this is the third contribution. And we really saw with our eyes that the very, very simple MC, MC algorithm really dominates this problem. Uh, and this algorithm is known as Glauber Dynamics. And uh, we were trying to prove ourselves wrong, but really even the simulation showed that at least for P up, up to 100,000, there's a very, very simple algorithm. We really did not try at all, but th that really solves the problem. And after that, we were, uh, were convinced that we should be able to, to close the gap. And we tried, and what we, I mean, although we did not succeed to go all the way, what we uh, managed to do, and this is our second com contribution, is to show that the complete absence of bad local minima for a part of the heart regime, which means that a trivial algorithm, a trivial greedy algorithm can actually, uh, and, and theoretically uh, improve uh, uh, the known results for approximate recovery uh, without uh, false negatives via local search. Okay, and so these are the, the three contributions we made. Uh, for most of the talk, uh, I will be talking about the first one because uh, I think this uh, notion of overlap gap property and how it relates to uh, lower bounds for MCMC methods um, is actually quite interesting and uh, quite nice. Although people who know me typically know that I talk about the upper bounds of MCMC methods. But um, yeah, for this talk, I will mostly focus on, uh, on our first contribution, but I will also say uh, some things in the end about the other two. Uh, sounds good? Okay. So what is this uh, overlap gap property? So, as I said, it's a geometric property in the solution space of the problem. And its existence provably implies that the large family of natural uh, MCMC algorithms will fail in solving the problem. Okay. Uh, it's inspired by spin glass theory, and it has been formally defined in 2013 by Gamarnik and Sudan for non planted models, and by Gamarnik and my co author in 2017 for planted models. And its appearance typically coincides with the hard regime of the problem. Okay, so in all these uh, random models, uh, typically right when this uh, hard regime uh, starts, the regime where our algorithm starts failing, we typically see that this uh, so-called overlap gap property appears. Okay, and in that sense, uh, statistical physicists believe that this is a uh, a fundamental reason why uh, uh, algorithms fail. And uh, let me mention also that uh, there is this conjecture that says the opposite, that the absence of the OGP implies that the problem is tractable via simple local search algorithms. Okay, so we know that its presence provably implies that uh, a family of uh, MCMC algorithms will fail. But there is also the conjecture, and this has been observed uh, in, in many, many cases, uh, that its absence implies that the problem is actually tractable and it's tractable via local search. 
Okay, and so is there a, but the, the intersection is non empty between the family of algorithms in the top and the family of algorithms in the bottom, the intersection is not uh, non empty. It's the same family. Well, you call them differently. In the top, you call some family of uh, and, uh, natural yeah. MCMC. In the yeah, bottom, yeah. you call them simple local search. So yeah, you, yeah, right. Maybe right, you should yeah. give them the same name. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, actually, it's a, okay, technically, it's a, the, the, the second one, it's a, it's a superset in the sense that we believe that uh, not just in CMC, but uh, even uh, in some cases, greedy algorithms succeed. Without uh, randomness, okay. so so yeah, so I should have it's 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 a, it's a superset because in some cases you don't need randomness at all and greedy things work. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. And actually, this conjecture has been uh, that is that the absence of the OGP um, uh, implies that uh, the problem is tractable via local search has been proven in certain set settings is recently by uh, Montanari. Okay, but in general, in particular in, in group testing, uh, that's, this is not clear. So uh, now I would like to start giving you a more formal taste for, uh, for what this uh, OGP uh, uh, notion is, at least for recovery models. So imagine uh, for a moment and at a high level, that uh, what we are doing is that we are observing data or uh, uh, that, that come from a probability distribution that is parameterized by um, a, a vector theta star. And our goal is to uh, infer what this uh, theta star is. Okay, so for example, in the group testing model, the data would be the results of the tests and the bipartite graph itself. The, the solution space would be the set of case sparse vectors in the, uh, with P entries. And the, and the hidden vector, the, the, the vector we're trying to infer, would be the indicator vector of infected individuals. Okay, so again, we observe data and that come from a probability distribution that's parameterized by a hidden vector. And our goal is to try and um, and recover this vector. Now, in statistical learning theory and machine learning in general, the way we are trying to um, uh, recover uh, the vector theta star is by coming up with some informative loss function, L, and then uh, trying to, to, to minimize uh, this loss, loss function. And the idea is that nearly uh, optimal solution for this loss function Will be will have a large overlap with uh, our uh, hidden vector. That is, they will be highly correlated with theta star. And and this way, by uh, doing this, uh, by solving this minimization problem, it's our way for doing recovery. This is uh, the only way we know how to do so. Okay. So for example, as we will see, for the group testing um, model, this informative loss function would correspond to solving some. Um, as uh, instance of, 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 uh, of set cover. Good. Now, informally, we will say that uh, the overlap gap property appears in these models if small values of the, the loss function are attained by two families of vectors. The first family is family is a family of vectors that is highly correlated with uh, with a hidden vector, which means that they have a large overlap, or if you will, the dot product between uh, the vectors in this cluster or in this family and the true vector is, is is large. And the other family is a family of vectors in which uh, uh, the the dot product between them and the hidden vector is small. Okay, so the overlap gap property will appear when uh, low values of uh, solutions are attained between uh, exactly two clusters, one cluster of vectors that are highly informative in the sense that they correlate a lot 
with the hidden vector and one cluster of vectors that do not correlate almost at all with a hidden vector okay so this is a this is like a promise problem it is a promise problem yeah it is a yeah so you have promised that it's it's one of these two and you have to distinguish them yep yeah so right so it's not a right so yeah it's so this is not an assumption it's something that uh, we observe in the model or not so no, I the model, yeah, yeah, yeah. but also in many optimization problems it's not a, a, it's not an assumption you just uh, it's it's you're you're uh, giving a how um, an easier problem to solve to the algorithm and you nevertheless show that it has to work hard right i see i see yeah yeah it's similar, right? I mean, you just, just you promise that uh, you just distinguish be, between these two cases. Well, I guess by definition, this will be hard because they are. Um, it um, will be hard at least for a class of algorithms that I hope to 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 convey what this class of algorithms look look like uh, right now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, to give you a better flavor for uh, what the overlap gap property is, sorry, although we will see a formal definition later in the talk, it will be helpful for me to, um, to define this function gamma of zeta, which is defined as follows. So basically is the value of the minimization problem that we care about when we restrict ourselves to vectors that have overlap exactly zeta so Z, sorry, exactly Z with uh, with our hidden vector. So gamma of Z is the best value we can get for our loss function when we uh, try to to minimize in the space where uh, all the all the vectors on case parts are, 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 are have a, 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 this norm property and also um, uh, have overlap. Uh, exactly zeta z with uh, with a, with our hidden vector. Okay. So I, I just uh, I'm just trying to clarify the in my mind the notation. First of all, when you say overlap, you really mean correlation in the usual sense. It's really correlation of two vectors, inner product. Right. Yeah. 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 They're inner product of norm one vector. They're, that's the overlap. Is the correlation. Right. right. Second, who is producing theta? I mean, the algorithm is supposed to produce theta, right? The algorithm is supposed to come up with uh, to output a value of theta that yeah. is closely correlated with theta star. This is the goal of the algorithm. Right, but but the point is that uh, there are there are setters that uh, have low value um, uh, uh, low value of the loss function, but they are not well correlated with, with exactly theta yeah, star. and that's a, that's a problem. How will the algorithm produce? Uh, we know to produce one rather than the other. Exactly. And, okay. Uh, but, but right now you are saying just assume that uh, for each particular value of z, if the correlation is z, what will the loss function be? Yes. This is my yeah. definition of gamma of z. And I'm saying, and the reason I'm I'm defining this function is uh, is to show you how uh, a problem that has the overlap gap property looks like. So in particular, it looks like uh, uh, it, it, it looks like uh, uh, the picture uh, on on the right, where this function gamma of zeta uh, is non-monotone. So it's like this, and basically, what you see here is uh, two clusters of uh, of um, uh, two clusters of solutions for forming. Okay, so one cluster of solutions is again the solutions that have low correlation or low overlap with a true vector okay and while they have a small uh, error for the loss function they are far from the truth okay so this is one cluster the other cluster is the cluster we want to reach and basically these are the cluster that, that has high correlation with the true value and also uh, attains good values for the loss function, okay? Now, the idea is that uh, if you were to, to pick 
in most problems, if you were to pick uh, a solution at random, so that to start your algorithm from, you would uh, you would start from uh, you would uh, end up in this cluster. So this cluster has high entropy. Okay, so a random assignment, uh, a, a, a random choice for the solution will uh, uh, will um, uh, will be in this cluster. Okay, and now the reason why uh, this is uh, this makes uh, the life of uh, local search algorithms very hard is is the following. Okay, so imagine that you have a look a, a greedy local search algorithm that works in the space of uh, of, uh, of of theta vectors with uh, norm one. Okay, and what it does is basically at every step it tries to, to jump to, to, uh, to the next vector that uh, minimizes the loss function, okay? Now, the point is that if you start with uh, a solution that is in this cluster, and these are the solutions you will get if you do a random initialization, then by greedy moves, you are stuck. You will never be able to, to, to pass this barrier, right? Because we're trying to minimize the function and there is no way that you can do this and jump to the to the other cluster that is very far away. Okay, because we are making uh, uh, local moves in a green. So this fashion. is the usual picture of a non-convex uh, region which has uh, local minima that are much worse than the global minimum, and you cannot uh, reach right. from yeah. there because there are hills on the way that. Uh, you cannot jump by local moves, but uh, right. you just change a bit the notion of the quality before and when you were talking about, uh, let's say, coloring, these were the you know number of uh, bits you are changing at every point, and here you move to correlation, but I guess if you are changing a few things, then the correlation cannot change much, so you are staying with the, the correlation is continuous in this uh, humming metric, for example. Yes, yes. But for example, in the in, in as we will see in terms of the of the group testing problem, we will soon see that correlation is really the between two vectors will be exactly how many bits these two vectors share. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, it's intuitive that they are related. Yeah. yeah. And and the reason uh, MCMC algorithms fail, that reasons that uh, so algorithms that are not entirely greedy, is that basically we expect them. Uh, to be to take exponential time in the um, in the height of this um, uh, of, of this error here. Yeah. Okay, so if you want to jump from here to here with an MCMC algorithm that uh, tries to minimize the loss function expectation, uh, what one can show is that the, ex the the running time will be exponentially in this uh, height of this uh, uh, of this graph here. Okay, so the, the height between the top of the black line and the and the uh, red one. Okay, so, so the is... height corresponds actually not to the number of uh, coordinates you need to change, but actually to the number of constraints that are there. Exactly. Yeah. So it's actually exponentially. Uh, so it's expo uh, typically it's exponentially in the maximum of the of the two. Yeah. Um, yeah, but greedy algorithms absolutely fail. Probably. Yeah. Good. So, um, so now, okay, so this is was kind of a high level for what the OGP is for uh, recovery models in general. Now I would like to, to describe it a bit more formally for, uh, for the group testing problem. Okay, so as a reminder, uh, we have a population of P individuals, K of them are infected, and we will think of the space basically of a uh, case parts uh, vectors with p entries okay and uh, we will denote by theta star the indicator vector that corresponds to the infected individuals so basically the vector that has exactly k non zero entries oh, uh, each one corresponding to uh, one of the infected individuals what we do is we perform n tests via the non adaptive bernoulli group test design and we see the uh, the test each test we see it as 
uh, as follows. So basically, uh, the, the individuals that participate in the test, we, th we think of them as a vector xi that has, um, that, that has p entries. And the outcome of the, um, of the result is basically the dot product between xi and theta star. So if there is, a, if there is overlap between xi and theta star, which is the vector in, of infected individuals, the outcome will be one. That is the, the, the test is positive. And if, it's, if there is no overlap, the outcome will be zero. Okay, so the goal will be to recover theta star by observing the vector that corresponds to the test results and the test design matrix that is n times p. It has n uh, rows, one for each test, and p uh, columns because uh, each test uh, will need to indicate who, uh, who were the individuals that have participated in the test. And the task of approximate recovery formally is to output a theta hat so that the Hamming distance between theta hat and theta star is a little low of k. Okay. Now, as I said, what we in the way we uh, do a recovery is by coming up with an optimization problem. Okay, and now I want to I want to describe this optimization problem in the problem of group test. Okay, so for that I will need the following definition. So uh, we will say that a set of individuals satisfies a certain test if one of the two following uh, one of the two following uh, things hold. A, if the test is negative, then none of the individuals should participate in the test. If the test is positive, then there exists at least one individual that participates in the test. Okay, in, in that sense, it, it's like uh, the, the notion of satisfying a test is is basically that these sets of individuals is actually consistent with, with the outcome of this test. Okay, does this make sense? And uh, the idea is, and the observation is, that finding a set of K individuals that satisfies all but a few tests applies approximate recovery for the following uh, lemma. Okay, so, uh, uh, we don't have to, to actually read what is stated in the lemma. The, the message here is what the algorithm needs to output is a set of K individuals that satisfies, uh, say, one minus epsilon n tests, where epsilon is an arbitrary small constant that is uh, 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 determined by the level of approximation we need to make. Okay. Now, this type of optimization problem is connected to a set cover in the following sense. Okay, so uh, uh, to see the connection, at, at first observe that the very first thing we can do in any algorithm is that we can remove from consideration any individual that participates in a negative test. These individuals are certainly not in fact, okay. So this is the very first thing we do, always. Now call the rest, the remaining individuals as potentially infected. Okay. Now, in the space of potentially infected individuals. So let, let me already ask, uh, is the, it's about, this will remove about uh, half the, um, no, no. Ah, no, no, sorry, the size of test is, is large, yeah. So, okay, but it, it's about, you, you set it up so that each test will succeed or fail, will be negative or positive with probability one half. So about one half of the tests will be, and this will determine, yeah, but, but this will be crucial to the success of uh, the analysis, I assume. Removing the negative, uh, yes, people yeah. in the negative test will be crucial for this constant, uh, you know, right. by passing this constant gap. Yeah, okay, exactly. And, uh, and yeah, this so is something, so this is a property. I'm just trying to figure out the property of the all function that you will use, and uh, I guess this is a property of the all function, 
when you get zero, then all of them are zero. Right, and yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Yeah, because it was, if it were linear tests, you wouldn't be able to do this. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, this is correct, yeah. So, uh, right, so after we remove any um, uh, individual that participates in a negative test, uh, we actually, uh, uh, the, the individuals that remain are actually sublinear in the number of, uh, in the initial population, and we call them as potentially infected. Okay. Now, in the space of potentially infected individuals, finding K of them that satisfy every test basically can be seen as a set covering problem in the following sense. So, um, or a vertex covering problem in the bipartite graph, if you will. So, uh, the elements of the set of the set cover problem are the positive tests. And the sets correspond to potentially infected individuals and contain all the positive tests in, in which these individuals uh, uh, participate in. If you want to see it um, uh, in a picture and you know in a vertex cover setting, um, uh, here the, 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 the individuals that are covered that are circled in red cover every test on the right, okay? In the sense that there exists uh, an edge that goes from um, uh, every test to one of the indiv individuals in the set. And what we need to, to it turns out that uh, if we find a set of individuals that indeed cover every test or approximately every test, then this is uh, highly correlated with uh, with the set of infected individuals. And this is the connection between uh, our loss function and, and the set cover problem. For example, for the exact recovery setting, we really need to find the unique solution in a planted set cover problem where um, uh, there exist exactly K individuals that cover everything on the right. And the information theoretic threshold uh, comes exactly at, at the point where the solution is unique. Okay, and because uh, on the left of, of the information theoretic threshold, there are more than one solutions that cover everything on the right, and this is why we cannot do um, uh, detection. Does that make sense? So in the information theoretic threshold, at least for the uh, recovery, uh, for the exact recovery setting, the unique solution is the set of cave uh, individuals that cover every test. And this is what we need to identify. And this is why, because a set cover is in principle uh, uh, an NP hard problem, at least in the worst case, this is why um, I said earlier in the talk that the estimator promised uh, by, uh, this, uh, by, by this theorem about Bernoulli group testing being information theoretically optimal does not necessarily imply an efficient value. Are there any questions here? Because um, I think this is kind of an important point for everyone to understand. Is the connection between the set cover and what we're trying to do clear? It's more like the definition. You just made it in a, into a picture. Uh, yeah. It, it, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, just it's, it's, the reduction is Totally direct. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Okay, so that okay, that's good that you that you understood that. So now, uh, let's again see things a bit more formally using the notation that I established earlier. So uh, recall that what we need to do is uh, recover theta star by observing um, uh, the test design matrix and the results and. In particular, what we assume is that the value of nu is uh, one minus, uh, satisfies this formula that one minus nu over k to the k is one half, and that the number of tests we are going to use are given by k log to p over k divided by um, a constant r, which we call the rate. And when the rate is one, then this corresponds to uh, the information theoretic threshold. And in general, 
uh, uh, we're trying to see for which value of R we can efficiently uh, uh, find solutions. Okay, so R goes from zero to one. And the smaller it is, the more tests we have, the more easier the problem. Okay. Yeah, but you want to get to one. We want to get one. Now, as Avi said, after ignoring every individual that participates in a negative test, we are left with roughly speaking half of the tests that are positive. And then um, uh, the number of potentially infected individuals that we're left with is given uh, by this expression. Okay, so it's, uh, uh, it's sublinear. Uh, it's the, the number of individuals that we are left with, it's sublinear in the original population. Now, let me define for each indicator vector in the population of potentially infected individuals, that is case parsed, let me define the number of, uh, the, the set of inconsistencies of theta to be basically uh, the positive tests that are not satisfied by theta. Okay, the, the, the positive tests that, if you will, are not covered by theta or uh, uh, right, uh, are not uh, compatible or consistent with uh, the current, uh, uh, with this certain theta. Okay, these are the tests that uh, have uh, zero overlap with uh, theta in the sense that uh, they are positive, but theta cannot explain why they are positive because the intersection of, of the people in the test and uh, uh, the people uh, that uh, are encoded by theta is empty. Okay, so there is an inconsistency here. Okay. But you are looking for a theta which, uh, which uh, uh, get uh, no inconsistencies. So what, we, what, what we're looking at is to, to minimize the, the number of inconsistencies. Ideally, we would, have, we would like to find the theta star vector that has zero inconsistencies because by definition it explains every test. But the optimization problem we are trying to solve is you know, to, approx to, to, to find a nearly optimal solution to that minimizes the number of inconsistencies. So, okay, so sorry, you are, you are, the output will all, theta will always have exactly k individuals? Yes. Okay. Because we know the value of k, right? Okay, yeah. So uh, yes, and, and the optimization problem we're going for that will reveal us the, if we solve it correctly, will, will reveal us the value of theta star is uh, minimize the number of inconsistencies. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Now, here is a, a, a slightly simplified definition of the group testing of the, of the algorithm like a property for the group testing model. So, the definition is for the zeta one, zeta two R overlap cap property. And we say that the overlap cap property zeta one, zeta two comma R holds if there exist two numbers, zeta one and zeta two, so that any vector, any case sparse vector such that is able to uh, attain a number of inconsistencies that is at most R, either should have overlap at most zeta one with the true vector or overlap at most, uh, sorry, at least zeta two with uh, the true vector. Okay, so what this definition says is that, the, that, a, that any solution that attains uh, at most R inconsistences so that the loss function is at most R, we have not explained at most R tests, should belong in one of two clusters. One cluster is very low correlated with uh, theta star in the sense that the overlap is at most theta one. The overlap here is, is, is literally the, uh, the, the size of the intersection between uh, the hidden, the hidden uh, solution and uh, our current solution, or it should uh, have high overlaps, which means the intersection is large. Okay. Well, is it normalized or not? So this zeta one and zeta two are numbers between zero and one or not? It's not normalized. It's, uh, it's uh, 
these are integers. I see, so, that these are integers. So it's between zero and K. It's between zero and K, and these are K sparse vectors. Yeah. And the dot product between K sparse vectors is basically the size of the intersection of the corresponding sets. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so we say that we have a zeta one, zeta two, uh, comma R overlap gap property. Again, if all the solutions that have at most R inconsistencies, oops, cluster into in, in two families, the ones that are far away from uh, the true vector and the ones that are uh, close to the, to the true vector. So we should think of zeta one as uh, something like epsilon k and the zeta two one minus epsilon k. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Exactly. And uh, the second part of the of the definition says that this cluster should be non-trivial in the sense that it should have at least one element. And the reason that that I'm saying that uh, this is a simplified version of the OGP is that at least in our paper there is a third um, a third element here that says. Uh, be, that between, uh, if you want to go uh, from one cluster to another, then you should go through uh, vectors that have high uh, a high number of inconsistencies. But I didn't want to confuse you here. Okay. okay. Already, but already with this definition, notice that uh, if let's say zeta one, as I've said, is uh, is um, uh, is epsilon times k, and uh, zeta two is one minus epsilon times k. This already forbids uh, the, sorry, this already proves that uh, greedy algorithms that are trying to uh, to, to jump uh, between uh, vectors that have common distance one will probably fail to jump from the low uh, the low correlation cluster to the high cor uh, correlation one. Okay. So this definition already gives lower bounds for greater algorithms. If we had the third, uh, the third part of the definition, we could also give lower bounds for a, a family of MCMC algorithms like the Metropolis chain or, or Glaber dynamics. But I don't think it's, so. This is extra notation. I don't think um, it will add uh, anything more to your understanding. Makes sense. Good. Uh, now you may ask, okay, so how do you one proves the existence of such a property okay. uh, in the problem. And the, uh, the answer is actually quite cute in the sense that uh, to prove the existence of, of, uh, of GP, we need to study a, a, a well-defined uh, problem, mathematical problem, which is basically the monotonicity of this function gamma we saw earlier. Let me remind you, uh, uh, that uh, gamma of zeta is basically the uh, value attained by minimizing our loss function, the number of, inc of inconsistencies, by looking at k sparse vectors that have exactly overlap zeta z with the uh, with uh, with the hidden vector. Okay, so the the reason I'm saying that uh, the 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 existence of, of OGP uh, is related to the monotonicity of this function is the following. So the main observation is that for the overlap gap property to appear, function gamma of z cannot be decreasing. Okay, so if the function gamma of z is decreasing or approximately decreasing, then, uh, then the, the, the picture looks like this, right? And there is no overlap. Okay, so the, the there, is, there is no uh, OGP. Okay, so uh, as the overlap increases, the the potential the, the loss function decreases because uh, we have assumed that gamma z is decreasing, and so we will not be able to see these two clusters forming. Okay. On the other hand, if gamma of z is not decrease, it's non monotone, it's not decreasing. And, and looks something like this, then the, the, the two clusters form. Okay, so we have one cluster here and one cluster here that attain small values for the loss function, yet uh, one of them has low overlap with the true solution and the other one has a uh, big overlap. 
But this is just because of the monotone nature of the set cover problem. No, it, this does nothing to do with a set cover problem. It has to do with the definition of uh, of the overlap gap property and, and gamma. No, I understand, but uh, the reason it will be it will be decreasing, I guess, because uh, the set cover problem is monotone. So the more, I mean, I, maybe I'm missing something. It will be decreasing, but I'm not sure I have a, an intuition that comes from set. I mean, it's it's highly non-trivial to see why it's not. Okay. Possible. Yeah. Maybe I'm. Yeah. I'm obviously missing. I, something. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, right. So how do we, okay. So this is what we are trying to, I hope you, uh, at least you see this proof by picture that uh, for OGP to exist, this gamma function needs to be non-decreasing. Okay. Uh, so, so, sorry, it should be non monotone yeah. yeah. So how do we prove, I mean, how, how do we study the monotonicity uh, of, uh, of, 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 of this function? We basically use uh, what is known as the moments method and uh, I will describe it briefly in the context of group testing. So uh, who, to, to, to explain that, I will need the following uh, random variable. So which is a counting random variable. So for any integer L and any integer uh, T greater than zero, ZL of T basically counts the number of uh, case sparse vectors that corresponds to potentially um, infected individuals that have overlap exactly L with a hidden vector and the inconsistencies they have is at most T. Okay, this is related to our gamma function in the sense that by definition, if gamma of L is at most T, if and only if the, this, uh, this set is non-empty in the sense that this counting random variable counts at least one uh, vector that has at most thin consistencies. Okay, so this is how this to find how gamma is related with this random variable. Okay, why is this helpful? Because then this is uh, how we apply the moments method, which is basically uh, this set of two uh, inequalities. So, oops, sorry, the upper bound is comes from the Markov inequality, while the lower bound comes from the Pelley's uh, sigmoid inequality. Okay, and why this is helpful? Well, if you find a number T1, and you can show that in expectation, the value of ZL of T1 vanishes as P goes to infinity in the sense of that it's little low of one, then by definition, this means that with high probability, uh, T1 is a lower bound on gamma of L. Okay, because this means that uh, there are no, um, uh, with high probability, it means that uh, ZL of T1 will be zero. And this means that uh, basically this set will be empty if you black in here T1, which basically gives you a lower bound for a gamma of L. Okay. Now, and this is why uh, this uh, first inequality is helpful. Now, uh, the second inequality, uh, it's, it's a bit more uh, uh, indirect to see, and it comes from the Chebsev's inequality, but if you establish that for a number T2, uh, this ratio between the second moment, between the, the square of the, of, the, of the expectation and the second moment, uh, goes to one as p goes to infinity, then uh, using the Chebsev inequality, you can prove that with high probability, T2 will be an upper bound on gamma of L. Okay. And the so idea the, is- The second, second uh, situation is, is uh, um, this random variable will be very concentrated. Right. Yeah. So that's that's really, but you need uh, it's sufficient to use Chebyshev. I mean, sufficient to use the second moment to see uh, yeah. the concentration. But it's concentrated as as best as you want, right? It's like uh, concentrated with the uh, yeah, square root uh, deviation. Yes. 
So, so, so sorry. So, what, what was the question? No, I'm just uh, oh, okay. to get my intuition about why the calculation. Uh, yeah. So it's really the the upshot is that this random variables capital Z is very concentrated. Right. Yeah. And uh, the the point is that in a, in all this um, in all these uh, random problems, it turns out that um, at least in many cases, it, it turns out that uh, we can find T1 and T2, so upper lower bounds and upper bounds that are very, very close together. Basically, they are uh, at most uh, 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 two apart. And this is known as the two point concentration, which basically gives you a very tight est estimation for what this uh, gamma curve will look like. So this is like in the like a random like a coloring of a random graph. So you exactly. know, yeah, I see. Okay. Okay. So uh, so in our investigation with Elias, so um, by the way, all these are heavily. I mean, typically these are heavily technical, and uh, I mean, I mean, sort of the second moment method. But in our case, even the first moment method was heavily technical to establish. I will uh, I will briefly explain why, but. Uh, what we found in uh, with Elias is that the first moment curve is decreasing. Okay, so uh, this means two things. So first of all, at the very least, this means that using this moment method, which is our only tool, there is no way we can use it to show the existence of OGP. Okay, because already the what we hope to be kind of the, the, the loose lower bound, the easy thing that we are later trying to prove that is uh, actually the, the reality. Already the easy thing is decreasing. So there is no way that we can get more information by doing the second moment method. Okay, so, so in other words, uh, the, we, using this moment methods, we would, we would not be able to prove formally lower bounds for uh, the MCNC methods. Okay. However, we, uh, uh, we know more than this, in this, at least we know more than this, in the sense that the first moment bound, it's typically tight and predicts, um, uh, predicts, pre predicts the, the curve in every, in every other model, including pattern click, regression, and sparse PCA. So when we did all the math, and it's, it, it was uh, you know, a lot of calculations, uh, um, uh, and you know, uh, technical uh, technical work, we realized that we will not be able to, to prove what we wanted. So we stop there and we uh, try to 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 go for upper bounds. Okay. So we did not do the second moment method because uh, it would not help us. Okay. So uh, because already the first moment shows uh, that the, that. The, the moment curve is decreasing. But let me tell you a bit why uh, the, how uh, this uh, lower bound looks like. So uh, our first theorem, at least in this uh, uh, contribution that has to do with the, with the LGP is that the first moment bound, the first moment lower bound for gamma of Z looks as follows. So basically gamma of Z is lower bounded by knee prime times a first moment bound function overlap gamma of Z that is implicitly given by the solution to this equation uh, where alpha here, alpha X of Y is, um, is uh, basically the KL divergence uh, between uh, two Bernoulli random variables. And this comes from uh, uh, large deviation bounds. Okay, so this is uh, so when you are trying to first moment, to do the first moment method, you you really need to be very exact with uh, with, your with your with your calculations. And uh, so uh, the lower bound uh, it really comes from um, from this implicit equation. But it's it's like a Hofding bound. It's the yeah. It's the it's the. Uh, Absolutely exact health yeah. Okay. okay, so, um, right. So now here's, here's the, the pickle. We have a function 
that is implicitly defined, and we need to prove that it's non decreased. Basically, we need to study its monotonicity. So, uh, this was already technical. And then uh, the second technical part of the work was you know, trying to prove that uh, this, to study the monotonicity of this function, we proved that it's strictly decreasing. And this required uh, you know, uh, quite to, for us to uh, uh, recall all the kind of uh, multivariable algebra we knew uh, back uh, in, in the university. And because it's, it's implicitly defined, but uh, anyway, uh, it's, uh, we prove that it's strictly decreasing. Okay, so our prediction, at least our first moment one prediction, is uh, that the OJP is absent and that we are in this case. And what I can tell you is that for sure, using the, the moments method, uh, that is the only tool uh, we have, we cannot prove anything more. Okay, so this is why we stop at this point. We said, at least in the paper, we say that this, um, this is typically, uh, this prediction, this fair response prediction is typically tight. But uh, the real reason why we not continue to do the second moment, the second moment method is that it could be heavily technical and it would not provide anything rigorous because uh, our prediction is that uh, the OGP does not exist. Okay, so if we really need to prove upper bounds, we really need to analyze algorithms, which is what we do in the second part of the paper. Okay. So uh, uh, now uh, here are some plots for how this implicit function looks like. So you see that as uh, uh, the rate increases, so, in, so initially uh, when the, the rate is uh, small enough, the, the, the curve is uh, highly, is, you know, it, it, it has a large slope because uh, the signal when the rate is small, and that is when we have many tests, the signal is large, which uh, translates into a, a function that has a high slope. But as uh, we increase the rate, and as we expect, uh, the, the, the function becomes flatter and flatter. And uh, to see uh, the contrast between a case where we know that uh, OGP exists, and this was from the original paper of uh, Gamard and Kent Elias, where uh, they showed the existence of um, uh, uh, OGP for the sparse regression model. So there, if you do the plots, then uh, you really see that um, the function is non-decreasing. Uh, sorry, it's, uh, it's non-monotone. Okay, and these are again the first moment bound plots for the sparse regression model. And that uh, is to say that uh, in this case, actually, they were uh, very accurate because uh, they also did the second moment there. Okay. So, uh, if there are any questions, I would like to, uh, for for the remaining um, uh, time, I would like to talk a bit about our local search uh, results. But let me know if uh, if anything is unclear here. In those plots that you have look almost linear, is that um, uh, like not just decreasing? But, but it's not right. It's not uh, right. It's not. A, it's right. I, I see. I see uh, your point. Um, it's because I mean, from a technical perspective, it's it, it's uh, it's because um, this alpha here, this alpha function, it's. Uh, the KL divergence, and sorry, where is it? So here you compare logs, basically. Mm -hmm. That's why that's why it's linear. I mean, I don't have a, a real intuition for that, but in technical terms, it's because the logs will uh, uh, basically will vanish as you go to. Uh, yeah, sorry, I don't have a, a better answer for that. So, um, okay. So uh, now what we showed in terms of upper bounds. So our main, th our main theorem here is that uh, basically, uh, so imagine that you want to study a gritty local search algorithm that uh, 
works in the space of k sparse vectors. Okay, so uh, this is the space, uh, of, so the k sparse vectors of potentially infected individuals. And imagine that we have a, a local search algorithm that moves from vector to vector by uh, minimizing the number of inconsistencies at its two humming distance neighborhood. Okay, so imagine that we want to analyze a very simple algorithm like that. Okay, so in this case, such a simple algorithm will succeed if uh, the underlying optimization uh, problem, that is the set cover problem or the, uh, the, the, uh, the problem of minimizing the number of inconsistencies has uh, no local, uh, no bad local minima. Okay, so in, in the sense that in the sense that the algorithm will not get get stuck until it finds really uh, the, uh, the the true vector, and inspired by the fact that it seems that the optimization problem is really smooth, we started a more uh, stringent or a more um, um, powerful uh, in terms of upper bounds notion of. Uh, optimization smoothness, landscape, landscape optimization smoothness, which is the absence of bad local minima. And uh, our result here is that for any k prime greater than k, there exists a function q, that is a function of k prime comma uh, and uh, comma slack uh, parameter zeta, so that if you have this many tests, then uh, this greedy local search algorithm uh, will approximately recover theta star with an overlap at least one minus theta k. Okay, so, uh, and we, we prove this by showing that uh, there are no uh, bad local minima as long as the number of tests is, uh, is at least this much. Okay, so this, uh, this quantity here, this log two over new to uh, e to the minus nu is not uh, an arbitrary number. It's basically uh, the hard regime for approximate recovery with no false negatives. So, and Q is a complicated min fun ma ma max function that comes from large deviation. So in other words, this theorem says that this grid local search algorithm provably improves the no closes, shrinks the computation statistical gap for the approximate recovery task with no false negatives, which is kind of um, uh, the hard task in approximate recovery and, and it's uh, relevant to uh, medical testing. That makes sense? So this, uh, uh, this was uh, our main contribution um, when it comes to local search. I, I don't want to, um, because already we have five minutes left, I don't want to say too many things about the, the proof of this theorem, but um, uh, I have to say it's not uh, conceptually very hard. We basically what uh, we want to, uh, to assure is that there are no bad local minima. This has a definition and we do all the, the calculations to, to find the threshold up to which uh, bad local minima do not exist. This is a technical, it needs heavy calculations, but it's not something conceptually brilliant. It's just that people have not tried this because they had, they really believed that this is a hard regime. So, and they did not look at local search algorithms. So this is why we think people had not observed this before. Uh, this is not going to work, right? I mean, this is uh, not going to get you to rate one. This is not going to get you to rate one. This is right. This is not because what we are studying here is a, a very stringent condition for um, uh, for convergence, which is the absolute absence of bad local minima. Okay, so ideally, yeah. you would like to analyze a more complicated process, mm -hmm. although still simple, something like. Uh, the Glauber dynamics, which again, an MCMC local search algorithm, but it's not entirely greedy. Okay, so it works over case sparse vectors, but it does not necessarily uh, uh, minimize the number of um, inconsistencies at every step. Okay, so it jumps from K, uh, 
I don't want to 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 really to, to describe it, but it's a it's a very simple algorithm that jumps from a case parse vector to case parse vector with uh, probability transitions that, uh, although they heavily bias uh, moves that uh, minimize the the potential the the loss function, the number of consistencies, they do not always do that. There's a slack for doing moves that actually increase the number of inconsistencies. And uh, this is what uh, we really would like to analyze. And uh, this is an ongoing work that we're trying to analyze uh, this global dynamic scheme. But what I can tell you is that this very simple algorithm really dominates the problem. And uh, so we did some simulation mostly in the beginning to convince ourselves that this problem is easy because we had done all these calculations and it seems that we get nothing. It seems that uh, we could not prove hardness. And then we really thought, okay, we should really see if this problem is hard or not. So we coded it up and uh, we did some simulations. What you see here is uh, three lines in each, uh, in each of the graphs. So the gray line, it's how often the Glauber dynamics succeeds in solving the underlying optimization problems, which is basically um, minimizing the inconsistencies. And as you can see uh, in all three examples here, the probability is one basically. Okay, so the, the algorithm really dominates the, the problem and it, uh, it minimizes the loss function. So the blue line and the orange line are the approximate and uh, exact recovery lines respectively. And they uh, do not match the, the, the gray line because uh, th this promise that if you minimize uh, the, the loss function, then you will have found the, 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 true, vac the, the true set of individuals is, uh, is, a, is, is a promise asymptotically. So, so basically, uh, as the number of individuals increase, this, these two lines will uh, tend to match the green line for, for large P. And you see, okay, so, it's, so here these are small numbers, but you will see it in the next slide that as we increase the number of P, these lines really start uh, going uh, to go um, uh, close to one um, from, from the very beginning. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, Fossi says, I warn you, I uh, have to leave. So thanks. And uh, Cynthia okay. will, uh, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> thank you. See yeah. you guys. See you guys. Absolutely. I only have one slide left anyway. And uh, so this, uh, so uh, this slide, as I said in the beginning, uh, so in all, in everything I said, um, I assume that the value of K, the number of infected individuals is known. However, uh, if you want to uh, deal with a problem when the value of K is not known, basically you have to, uh, to implement basically this um, uh, small and satisfying set estimator, which is basically solving the, the set cover problem uh, I explained earlier without knowing the value of K, but this is uh, not a big problem because Basically, what you want is to find the, the smallest value uh, of K that satisfies every test. Okay, so uh, it's, not a, it's not a big deal. And uh, what we did is that with, with this Glauber dynamics algorithm, uh, we use it as a subroutine to implement this theoretically optimal smallest satisfying set estimator, which is a, does not require knowledge of K. And what we show in, the, in this paper is that this really a simple algorithm uh, outperforms other algorithms that have been used uh, in practice out there. In particular, that performs algorithms that, are, that utilize sophisticated methods like branch and bound and linear programming relaxation techniques. So we were quite happy with that because although we are theorists, it's for me, it was the first time that we, using theory, we came up with uh, something uh, that is simple that may have uh, actual uh, practical implications, uh, yeah, because it beats um, the state of the art, and it actually beats uh, sophisticated techniques like batch and bound and linear programming. So uh, 
with that being said, uh, that's all I had to say. Oh, sorry, future work. Yeah. So, um, so for future work, uh, we really want, we are really uh, working on trying to closing the gap. We're really working on trying to analyze uh, global dynamics to, to close the gap. And uh, we're also working on trying to understand if uh, Bernoulli good group testing is good for exact recovery as well, not just approximate recovery, because at least uh, our um, simulation show that uh, the Bernoulli group test design is also good uh, for exact recovery. But more generally, in this area of computational statistical gaps, uh, the main two directions is the, are the following. So first of all, is to show connections between, between all these methods for uh, uh, proving lower bounds for families of algorithms. Basically show one method that will work for every algorithm, or at least show that uh, uh, the, the reason one lower bound works is the reason why uh, the other one works. And the second direction is that to prove that the absence of the overlap properly as a black box already implies the success of MCMC algorithms and you don't need to do a new analysis every time. So um, let me know if you have any questions and uh, thank you. Any questions for Fotis? Yeah, Fotis, um, like, would you conjecture similarly that there is no